the first lawyer and uh, he was here from about 1920 until the late 1960s when he passed away and his name is Barney Williams, was Barney Williams, he was very well known and so then Gilbert was telling me that he in fact uh, kept all of Barney Williams um, legal books so he had all the, the old library and he was wondering if they could end up being in our office. So I immediately agreed, and he brought them down the following week. Because after the 1960s, there was no lawyer in Alert Bay. So Gilbert, uh, amongst the many skills he had, also became an unofficial lawyer. And he would help people in court. Because actually, Alert Bay had a courthouse for a long period of time. So Gilbert would volunteer to help people, and he would go and argue cases as an unofficial lawyer. So I think that's also why he, um, he probably looked at the books as well to perhaps help him. So Gilbert went on to himself actually argue cases in court, which was, which was uh, quite wonderful. And they were always uh, very colorful, interesting cases that he helped people with. He had a very good command of the English language in terms of he could do a crossword puzzle faster than any of us could do a crossword puzzle. So he certainly was not lacking in vocabulary or understanding of the English language, but um, his Italian accent definitely stuck with him for the whole time. Uh, I guess in total he was here for 40 years almost. Uh, in this community and still, especially when he was getting excited about something around the council table or something, then his Italian accent would get thicker and thicker and thicker. Uh, I remember one specific time when we had some government people here that were, there was a big disagreement about something that Gilbert wanted to do and so they got him quite mad. And the madder he got, the thicker the accent got, until finally, by the end of the discussion, he was speaking Italian. He wasn't speaking English at all. And waving his arms in good Italian <laughs> fashion, and uh, they left not understanding what <laughs> the problem was. So we used to have a lot of fun teasing him uh, about m trying to mimic his Italian accent, like... Uh, You've been in this country for 40 years and you still don't speak any English so good. How come? <laughs> you know? So, uh, which would make him madder and make his accent get thicker. So, yeah. it was... He was extremely proud of where he came from and uh, that would come up very often, you know. Um, where I come from, this is the way we would do things. And where I come from, and, and as you know, he went back quite, quite frequently to see family in Italy. And... Uh, so yeah, we would always tease him about that too, you know, if it was so good where you came from, how come you don't go back there? <laughs> and just to just to keep him going again. Yeah, that was so yeah, he was definitely an Italian, or even till the till the very end. Um 
of his life and uh, and uh, yeah and I think part of him is still there you know part of part of his personality <laughs> There was a time in Italy where you could apply to have a dual citizenship, but he was proud of being Canadian and he wanted to keep that. And so he didn't apply for his dual citizenship. Um, he never thought that there was a, a separation. He taught his children to be proud of their native heritage and as well as his Italian heritage. How I got the nickname Guela, a school project was to talk about a, a famous ancestor on, on our native side that did something spectacular for our culture. And because I wasn't familiar yet with, with my native side, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I have to do a project on, a, on a, an ancestor, something that they did um, that stood out. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you about your, uh, an ancestor of yours, his name is Frederico Guela. And uh, what happened is, the emperor of um, Austria wanted to take um, the northern part of Italy and claim it as, as his own. Frederico Guela heard about the story and he said, uh, to, he went to all the townspeople and said, don't do it. I'm, I'm telling you how I remember now, okay? I'm just I'm relating because my dad told me the story many years ago. So Federico Guela went to all the townspeople in northern Italy and said, don't do it, don't, don't give up your, your land, don't give up your language, you're Italians, this is, this is Italy, we're going to keep it that way. So because he loved his country so much, he, he died. When Dad told me the story, I told my friends at school, I, I said, well, I don't have one on my native side, I said, but I can tell you about a great man from my, from my Guela side. So I repeated the story to them. And from that day forward, they called me Guela. So, in 1993, Dad and I went to Italy together, and we actually, he actually brought me to Rovereto. You, you're familiar with that, Rovereto, and we went to the Osario, and I've got pictures of it. We went to the actual Osario and see Federico Guela's name up on a plaque. So that was pretty special. When the mayor rides, when the mayor rides, everybody. When the mayor rides, look in the sky. When the mayor rides, everybody. When the mayor rides, look in the sky. When the mayor rides, everybody. When the mayor rides, look in the sky. Well, when I was a young kid, that <clears throat> my grandfather had so much influence in me of being a leader that I wanted to do it in a different form of what he did. So when I first started, it was trying to make it for the youth and just all walks of life to know where I come from and what he taught me in life, like the life skills and how to present myself the way that he would have in the politics and just the ordinary life, it, it, like everything that he's done. I wanted to do it in a certain way that I could be respected the same way he was. And another thing I would like to share about my father is um, our love for opera. We loved, well, one, one opera singer in particular, Luciano Pavarotti. I loved him. I had all his CDs and, well, actually there were cassettes at the time. The CDs weren't in. So I was looking through the newspaper one day and I seen that Luciano was going to be in Vancouver. And I said to my husband, oh, Roddy, I said, listen, Luciano's going to be in Vancouver. Dad's birthday's coming up at 60th. So it was a milestone for him. I said, why don't we get him a ticket? And he goes, yeah, we can do that. And I said, mm, I said, my birthday's on June 20th. See, three days before that. I said, why don't you buy me a ticket and I'll buy dad a ticket and then he and I can go together. And he says, um, yeah, we can do that. So we went to his house for his big birthday. He opened up his present and he was so happy. And so was I. And that was, that was really special because I didn't really get to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with dad. Not, not really. So to me, that was really, really special. So we got up, we went to Vancouver, got dressed really fancy, really, really fancy, and uh, went and had a nice, some hors d'oeuvres, like cocktails. Then we went to the opera. Luciano did seven encores that night. I think he knew I was in the audience. <laughs> he did it for me. <laughs> seven. <laughs> it was pretty good. It took him 25 years before he went back to Italy. It took a long time. So he was always remembering the poor 
part um, and how hard it was to survive. And when we finally went back to Italy, he was really very surprised, very happy, and amazed at the progress in which the country had gone through from what he remembered as a child. Because we were in Italy and talking with his family, I can't tell you everything that they said because it was all in Italian, and I don't speak Italian, but there was many, many discussions, arguments, and laughter. But he was happy and really impressed with the progress in which Italy had made and recovered. And he was forever bringing things home that he thought was good. He passionately wanted the square. He wanted also, he wanted to have a fountain. And we said, why would you want a fountain when you've got beautiful Johnson Straits in the background? You've got the beautiful mountains behind there. And he was quite, he, he tried and tried and tried to get us to agree with putting a, a fountain in there. And so we kept saying, no, no, no. Uh, we built the square and he, we had a, we had a, a contest to name the square. And the people all submitted names, what they wanted, what they thought it should be called. And many years ago, when the island was first settled by two, two fellows, Spencer and Hewson, to put in the fish saltry, uh, the f names that were submitted were Spencer and Hewson. Th th people thought that we should call it Spencer and Hewson Square. And Gilbert did not think we should call it that. And we, not telling anything to council, he invited the mayor, uh, Mayor Paulin from uh, Victoria, to come and uh, present us with a with a plaque, for to, with the name of the square on it. So in comes the poor mayor of Victoria, didn't know what was going on. None of us on council knew anything about it, and he had this he had this beautiful big brass plaque that said Harmony Square. Harmony Square on it, and the grace of God said, well, "No, that's not the name of the of the square." And Gilbert, I I thought he thinks I think for sure he thought that we were going to be embarrassed by by all of this and go along with his ideas. And so, no, we we weren't embarrassed at all. We told the, we told the mayor of uh, Victoria that no, that was not the the correct name, and so we made him take the plaque back. Gilbert was not, he was not happy at all, at not happy at all. And so um, as far as I know, the, the square still is unnamed. I don't, I don't know if it has, even has a name to this day. So I still, I call it the Spencer and Houston Square. So when, uh, but the, the, Gilbert's had the last laugh on us because when Gilbert died, the community took up a collection and guess what's in the town square is 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 Gilbert's fountain, and there there it is. And I thought I could just see Gilbert just laughing and laughing, thinking, "Ah ha! I've I've won! I've won!" That was the funny part of it. And and the little then the urns we had we added the urns to the to the square and had flowers in them. And Gilbert and I used to plant the urns with with flowers and plants because he loved to garden. He was a good, reasonably good gardener, as as he was as as he was a mayor. <laughs> well, originally, down at the town square, what we call the town square now, it was just going to be a parking lot. And all of a sudden, he came up with a bright idea that uh, we'll make a town square out of it. So he went to Vancouver and uh, found an Italian place that made these spindles. It was called Ital Decor. <laughs> and he ordered all these spindles and they all turned up and he told me I had to put it together. So I said, okay, I'd uh, do that. So I built the tops and we put the spindles. And then he decided that uh, while the spindles were too expensive and they were gonna, we were gonna build them here. And uh, he bought a mold 
and uh, I started to build spindles. Uh, well, two, about two more, so it would take, uh, every two days we built two, two spindles, which works out to one a day. And uh, I did all the spindles for the, for the whole town. It took months. And uh, we changed the tops around a little bit and here and there and did a little bit of difference. But uh, yeah, he was going to make a little illy here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, part of it worked out. When Gilbert separated from his first wife, his mother came from Italy, and she was here three years helping Gilbert to raise his children. And she was a very strong woman. She was stood four foot 11, but a real bumblebee. I don't know what to call her. But she was a very good cook, and, and um, some of the things I learned from her. Um, and actually, she was the one, she told Gilbert that I was the one that he should marry. It wasn't Gilbert's idea, it was her idea. And I learned this many, many years later, that I was her choice. But she, um, we got along well. We always had somebody to translate for us because she didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Italian. Um, she was here three years. And when she went back to Italy, she took Gilbert's two youngest children with her. So Antonio and Anna Maria were raised in Italy and uh, Tony came to Canada when he was 16, and Anna Maria is still in Italy. È stata dura quando mi sono mosso quando sono tornato. Non parlavo inglese, sono tornato qua, non parlavo una parola in inglese perché sono dovuto tornare subito quando le scuole sono finite, non c'era, non potevo lavorare in Italia, quindi mi sono mosso, sono tornato in Canada e non parlavo, non parlavo una parola, ho dovuto imparare l'italiano. I mean, l'inglese, e ho dovuto lavorare nello stesso tempo, lavorare, questo è stato duro, i primi sei mesi era come un brutto sogno, così, cioè, un incubo, i primi sei mesi era un incubo, i primi due mesi era un incubo, non volevo andare da nessuna parte, non volevo uscire, perché, boh, non conoscevo nessuno, mie sorelle e basta, capisci? Dopo mi sono abituato, e più mi sono abituato, e più mi è piaciuto, e mi sono realizzato, e questo lo voglio vivere che sono tornato in Italia due o tre volte, ma, ma quando sono tornato mi piace visitare l'Italia, ma non vorrei vivere in Italia, capisci? non vorrei eh, lasciare questo, questo è me, questo, questo territorio, questa parte del mondo è dove mi sento più, più al naturale, più è like cura belon. When I was a little girl, my grandmother came to live with us from Italy and she didn't speak English. So I was forced to learn young. So by the time I was 10 years old, I was fluent in both English and Italian. And also I learned French in school, but I never very seldom used it. And I learned also m my mother's tongue, which I know I'll understand a few words, and, but speaking it is very difficult, but I understand it a little. When I was growing up and speaking Italian at home, my grandmother was always spoken dialect. So the first time I went to Italy, when we were going down to Riva, we we're going into the, into the town center, I'm speaking to her, she goes, mangia, parla italiano. I said, I thought I was, but I was speaking at their dialect and I didn't realize it because I didn't understand dialect and Italian at that time. So then I, as I got older, I understood, okay, dialect is, for example, come here and they key. But in Italian, it's a vieni qua. So I started to learn the difference as I got older. And I understood when she said, ma parla italiano, Angela. 
Because at first I didn't know what she meant. I thought I was. <laughs> I was ignorant to that at the time. <laughs> with my father, with his, his mother being here, my Nona, they, we spoke only Italian and my friends spoke Italian and in our home there was only Italian because my grandmother would not learn English. Uh, the grocery store people, they s learned Italian. The, the farmer that brought eggs, he learned Italian. Everybody learned Italian and, uh, and my Nona never learned any English in three years. <laughs> When we were in Italy, my cousin Amelia, my late cousin Amelia, loaned us her car. So dad and I traveled all over northern Italy and he showed me all the beautiful spots and everything. And inside her car was every cassette that Luciano Pavarotti ever recorded. So dad and I drove everywhere blaring the music. And because we, we, we grew up speaking fluent Italian, when my nona, our nona lived here for three years, I'm sure you, you know that. So we, we spoke fluent Italian, but when Nona went back to Italy, I was eight. And I got teased a lot for speaking our language. My friends would poke fun because they didn't know Italian. There was no, no, my dad was the only Italian in Alert Bay. And so when they heard us talk, they would point fingers, ah, 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 and that, that did a little bit of, it hurt me. So we kind of just, I, I forgot. Angela, my eldest sister, still speaks it. I understand it when I hear it. I know what the conversation's about. I can pretty much tell. Anyway, I'm getting off track, <laughs> so, oh no, I'm not. So we listened to the CDs, or the, the cassettes, and dad translated every aria, every single aria he translated to me. And so, needless to say, some of them were happy and some of them were sad. But I, I remember driving up the, the windy mountains and tears streaming down my face because one aria was so sad. We're like, is this based on a true story, dad? Please say no, but yeah, that was really special. Sono tornato in Italia, mi è mancato tantissimo, i primi due o tre mesi era tutta l'Italia, pensavo ai miei amici, la famiglia, tutta la gente che ho lasciato indietro, mi mancavano molto, era parte del mio dolore, ma quando, quando ti abitui, quando vedevo l'Italia in tv, ogni piccola cosa d'Italia era mio, emozionato, sì mi ricordo questo e quello, ma, ma è, è vero, venendo qua mi sono reso conto che io I mean, non, non lasciavo qualcosa indietro, ce l'ho con me qua e aggiunge qualcosa, like, questa vita qua è quello che imparo, quello che imparo ogni giorno, la gente che conosci, o, o i lavori che fai, è you know, parte della vita, è inter interessante, è stato un, un viaggio interessante. Antonio è un buon lavoratore, 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 è un And he's very good, he's kind, he's like his father. He's good to people, he treats people good. So he's accepted. Now we don't have fishing anymore in our community. It's collapsed in our community, but he has, he's, he gets called to, for other jobs that our, our tribe has initiated. So, because he's a good worker, he's like his dad, hard worker. Definire la mia identità sarebbe, well, come mi vedo io, come mi sento, Well, come persona mi sento, well, well, prima di tutto mi sento fortunato, well, fortunato di vivere in un posto come questo e aver vissuto in Italia, like, culturalmente qua, qui sull'isola, essendo mezzo indiano mi sento uh, privilegiato, no? avendo la, avendo, sapendo quello che so, eh, essendo vissuto in Italia, adesso vivere qui in Canada, così ho... Ho vissuto le due vite, le, le, um, ho vissuto le due culture che sono parte di me, la cultura italiana e adesso la cultura indiana che è la mia altra metà. Così mi sento fortunato prima di tutto perché quando sono tornato mi sono sentito uh, orgoglioso di essere indiano. Mentre like, tanta gente qua non, non sono così, si sente un po' no, imbarazzati, ma non, non so. Per me, me stesso, eh, mi sono orgoglioso di essere indiano, perché è una cultura meravigliosa, penso, eh, per me. Antonio, he's a partner of my youngest daughter, Andrea, and they've been together for a couple of years now. Yeah, and we really appreciate him because he helps us out and he's, he's 
treats us good, and we treat him good. He's a good kid. And I'm teaching him our language. I want him to speak our Kwakwala too, our Kwakwala language. So as much as I can, when I have, I want him to learn. I said it'd be really nice with his Italian accent. Misha too. Misha. <laughs> but he is lucky because he speaks Italian, then English, and then so he can pick up the other language easier. See me, it's English. So learning another language would be easier for him to pick up than me. So. Thank you. Lo sento, quella parte in me, in me l'ho sempre sentito, quando vivevo in Italia sapevo che c'era qualcosa di differente, I felt, mi, so, mi sentivo differente in, molte, molte, in alcune cose dai miei amici, e dopo, quando sono tornato in Canada l'ho capito, tante robe, perché penso di, uh, penso di belong, what's belong, appartengo più qua che in Italia penso.